How's it going, American History students? This is Mr. Bell coming back at you with another video lesson. Today, we are going to cover the key battles of the American Civil War. Now, we're not going to hit on every single battle in here. For example, the Battle of Chattanooga <laughs> is a rather large battle in the Civil War that we're not going to talk about. I'm hitting the key ones as far as the turning points that change the tide of the war as well as the beginning and the end of the war. Uh, the Civil War is a class in and of itself when you go to college, if you say are a history major or if you're like a political science major and you minor in history. Uh, and they dive deep <clears throat> into every one of these battles. I mean, the Battle of Gettysburg alone, you could spend probably a week on at the collegiate level. But... For the purposes of this lesson, I am going to cover the big ones. So, let's get into it with the Battle of Bull Run. The first major battle of the American Civil War uh, takes place in Virginia. Virginia is going to be a hotbed for this war. Makes sense when you think about the Confederate capital is in Richmond, Virginia. This is also known as the Battle of Manassas. Now, <laughs> this is going to be the place where the second most famous Confederate general behind Robert E. Lee uh, literally makes a name for himself, and that is uh, Stonewall Jackson. At the Battle of Bull Run, which is going to end up being a big Confederate win, uh, you had incoming forces from the Union who were outnumbering Stonewall's men by about two to one. And very similar to the Alamo, where the Texans are holding off uh, Santa Ana's man, except in this case, it is going to be the people who are outnumbered, the Confederates here, that end up winning this battle. And it's really just a play defense type of battle until reinforcements and an escape plan arrives. So near Bull Run, which Bull Run's a creek, there is a relatively busy train station. And Confederate reinforcements are set to arrive via train any moment. There's a problem, though. You have the Union soldiers closing in on the Confederate soldiers. Now, Jackson gets his nickname here by holding up like a stone wall, hence the name Stonewall Jackson, until the reinforcements arrive and are able to uh, thwart the advance of the Union soldiers. This is a big wake-up call uh, for President Lincoln, that this isn't going to be some rebellion that can be squashed, but rather this is going to be an all-out civil war that he thinks can last three years or more, which of course it ends up doing. And it allows him to get a lot of people to enlist before, of course, there is a military draft used for the American Civil War. But big Confederate win, besides, besides Fort Sumter, you know, the first battle of the Civil War, Fort Sumter is the culmination kind of of Lincoln's campaign uh, election and the South's reaction to his presidency, whereas this is a more formal starting of the war as far as the battles that will take place over the next four and a half years. Antietam. Uh, Antietam, also known as the Battle of Sharpsburg in Maryland, uh, was the bloodiest single day of the war. You see the numbers there. 22,000 killed, 16,000 uh, wounded. It's a Union victory, but that's not why it's that important. The reason it's important is because the sheer death totals uh, from the Battle of Antietam in Maryland make their way back to France and England. It takes a bit, but they do make their way back to them. And why would that be the case? France and England are on the brink of intervening on behalf of the Confederacy in order to keep the cheap cotton flowing for the textile mills. Once both the French and the British see the uh, number in one day, 22,000 uh, in one day killed, they're like, we want no part of this. It's not worth it. Uh, it's their war. Let's let them fight it out. Of course, that goes back to cotton diplomacy. Now, had the British or the French or especially both have intervened on behalf of the Confederacy. It might have turned out a whole lot different, but seeing these type of numbers in a single day uh, really, really 
strikes fear into the heart of the British and the French that they want to be no part of this bloody civil war. Gettysburg, definitely the most famous battle of the American Civil War. Of course, it's followed by the Gettysburg Address. I may jump back to that here in a minute. We covered that some in a previous video lesson. It's the turning point of the Civil War. Now, here's what you're starting to see. What started out as a defensive war for the South has all of a sudden turned into an offensive war. They've gotten kind of greedy. Uh, that's why you're seeing battles in Pennsylvania instead of in the South where they had the home field and they could play defense at places like uh, Bull Run in Virginia where the war got going. Now, this is the turning point of the American Civil War. It's the bloodiest battle of the war. 28,000 Confederate ca uh, casualties, 23,000 Union deaths. And at the end of this battle, after some uh, mismanagement by a Confederate general, uh, General Pickett, you have Lee, who is forced to basically go on the run. And when he's put on his heels and he's put uh, to be on the run, especially as he goes to hide in the mountains of Virginia and try to meet up with reinforcements, as we'll talk about here in a minute, it just really disrupts the overall strategy and battle plan of the Confederate soldiers, which had already shifted because they're fighting in Pennsylvania as opposed to fighting these battles in the uh, south where it looked like they would originally uh, take place. Pickett's charge was a uh, lunacy. Uh, it was an uh, old school type of warfare. When I say old school, more like the British tried to use on us during the Revolutionary War. So the fact that he did it not once, not twice, but about three charges and cost so many, uh, Confeder so many uh, Confederate lives uh, was a big, big mistake. Pickett's not one of those generals you hear talked about that much. That is why. Now, what follows is, of course, and I'm going to go back to this. I think we covered it last time, the Gettysburg Address. Not too long after this, they get the battlefield cleaned up. They turn it into a memorial and a cemetery uh, for many of the wounded, sorry, many of the ones that have passed, and some did die after their wounds uh, were not able to be properly treated. This is almost bigger than the battle itself because it really brings into focus the cause of the war, the purpose of the war, the need for the North to win the war. And this is where Lincoln really makes no bones about it. This is a war about not only ending slavery, but striving for the equality that America promised its citizens, all citizens in its founding, and that the people who died at Gettysburg shall not have died in vain, uh, because we can't allow the South to win this war, is how Lincoln views it. Uh, so the address, just as big, if not bigger, than the battle So Of course, we talked about that in 7.3. Now, Vicksburg, this is what some people refer to as the second turning point or the southern, southern turning point of the American Civil War. This is when Ulysses S. Grant, who uh, replaced McClellan, who Lincoln fired, uh, due to him overthinking uh, and losing big battles like Antietam. Uh, this is where Ulysses S. Grant uh, is able to take control of the Mississippi River. It's the main waterway that the South had been using. And at this point, it's almost game over for the Confederacy. Battle of Vicksburg. This is called the Peacemakers. This is one of the more famous portraits that you have of a president meeting uh, with his military advisors and generals. So here we have uh, Abraham Lincoln. He is uh, on board the River Queen. The River Queen is something if we were in class you'd have probably heard a little bit about, uh, but for the purposes of a video lesson, it was Lincoln's steamboat. Uh, that was a presidential steamboat, much like our president would use Air Force One. Lincoln used the River Queen to navigate over the course of his presidency, which was defined by the American Civil War. And this is a meeting on the River Queen in which you have, again, the title of this is called The Peacemakers, which is a little bit ironic when you hear what comes out of this meeting. Uh, you have, of course, Lincoln 
And here you have the Secretary of War. I cannot remember his name. I want to say Stanton, but you can Google check me on that one. Uh, and then more importantly, though, the ones I want to focus on are you have Ulysses S. Grant and William Sherman. Now, William Sherman is an extremist when it comes to his views on how the South should be treated uh, during the Civil War and after the Civil War. He sees them as treasonous traitors uh, that should be punished, everyone in the South, even people who didn't own slaves, because they, uh, were, they took part in a sham nation in the Confederate States of America. So what you see here in this famous uh, painting is Sherman pleading his case to President Lincoln to allow him to use total war, which is destruction of the South. And Lincoln's debating this because even after he wins at Gettysburg and Vicksburg, you have a Confederacy that is refusing to give up. Now, a lot of that has to do with the fact that Robert E. Lee is still in the wind, that they, he is hiding in the mountains of Virginia, and they have not been able to locate him. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant was kind of torn on this. So here's what Lincoln allows Sherman to do. If the Confederacy will not give up, he will give them a sample of total war that he hopes will break the spirit of the Confederacy rather than all out total war across all 11, all 11 of the Confederate States of America. Again, Sherman's name is the Mad Dog, but the Mad Dog needs somebody to allow him off the leash, in this case the Commander-in-Chief, President Abraham Lincoln. So this is where you get Sherman's march. Georgia is going to be the sample of total war that Lincoln thinks the nation will need. Here, Sherman marches from Atlanta to Savannah, quote-unquote, breaking the spirit of the South. Everything is destroyed. Innocents are killed. Plantations burned to the ground. Slaves liberated. And he marches from, from Atlanta to the coast of Savannah. At the same time this is going on, you have Lincoln and Grant working on a plan to capture uh, the Confederate capital of Richmond, Virginia. So it's a two-pronged finish to this fight. Sherman's march gives a sample of total war. If they can capture the capital, hopefully this will bring an end to this bloody conflict. Part of Sherman's march was his calling card, which was the Sherman necktie, which you had railroad tracks ripped up from the ground. Again, these are not going to be as sturdy as a railroad track you would see today. Uh, but they were ripped up from the ground and wrapped around trees. That was the, as if the death and destruction uh, that was behind Sherman <laughs> didn't tell you where he had been. These Sherman neckties were supposed to uh, do the trick. Some of this is covered in the infamous, I think it's 1938-1939 film, uh, Gone with the Wind. When I say he destroyed that part of Georgia, I mean he literally especially when you look at the military capabilities at the time. We're not talking about you know, any aerial power at this point in American history, but it was just sheer will and manpower to cause as much destruction and heartbreak uh, to the South as just a sample. And the sample shows that this will be the entire South if, if and of course we know eventually when, the Confederacy uh, does not surrender to the Union. Now, Richmond is captured by Grant, but General Lee is still missing. This culminates at the Battle of Appomattox Courthouse, a battle in which 500 men died. That's a lot, but compared to the 28,000 uh, people who died on the Confederate side in Gettysburg and the 23,000 that died on the Union side, I hate to say it like this, but it's a drop in the bucket. At the Battle of Appomattox Courthouse, Grant prevents Lee from meeting up with Confederate reinforcements. Uh, Lee surrenders to Grant at the courthouse. They have what's called a gentleman's agreement. They each share uh, a bottle of whiskey, and they negotiate the end of this war. So, where are we at at this point? The war is over. Richmond has been captured. Lincoln has just won re-election. 
So Lincoln now has to kind of turn his attention to reconstruction or remaking, reforming the United States, bringing those 11 southern states back into the Union uh, to make things right for a better America following the Civil War. Now, one of Lincoln's favorite things to do before the Civil War was to go to the theater. And he had a private box at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. He didn't go the entire Civil War, uh, but after the Civil War is over, he decides that he and his wife, Mary Todd, uh, will go to see a play. Now, John Wilkes Booth is a failed actor, a Southern sympathizer. The goal here with, of himself and a few other conspirators is to restart uh, the Civil War. Uh, you have an attempt here to uh, not only kill Lincoln, but to kill Vice President Johnson, Secretary of State Seward, and I think it's Stanton, and Secretary of War Stanton. So kill these four big heads of state, the main one being Lincoln, without his leadership, the Union will fall into turmoil, allowing the South to rise again. So, John Wilkes Booth, who is really debating whether or not to commit this assassination, actually ends up going across the street to a whiskey bar to get some liquid courage. The Secret Service agent, keep in mind Secret Service is not what it would be today, but they still had it. The Secret Service agent at the bottom of the stairwell to Lincoln's private booth uh, at Ford's Theater had grown bored. He had also went across to get a drink at the whiskey bar, which was not that busy because this is a establishment that people would frequent before and after plays at Ford's Theater. Uh, and ironically enough, the Secret Service agent and John Wilkes Booth are in the whiskey bar at the same time. Unfortunately for President Lincoln, John Wilkes Booth finishes his drinks first. He goes surprisingly to, to find that an unguarded door up to the presidential booth at Ford's Theater uh, is easily accessible to him, walks up to the top of the stairs, uh, gets a gun right to the back of President Lincoln's head, pulls the trigger, shoots him. Lincoln's not dead immediately. Then, Link, then uh, John Wilkes Booth jumps off the balcony onto the stage, uh, and he yells, Six Semper Tyrannus, uh, thus always death to the tyrants. I think it's Latin. And, uh, the, and, the, and this is his kind of proclamation that he is restarting the Civil War. Now, he hurt his leg. Uh, he actually broke his leg on the way down from the booth to the stage. Now, John Wilkes Booth actually gets a veterinarian to work on his leg, a veterinarian named Dr. Mudd, uh, and he goes and he runs and from the authorities. It takes him a while, but they eventually track him down. Uh, they track him down in a barn, and they end up burning him alive. Now, ironically enough, John Wilkes Booth attended President Lincoln's second inauguration. Second inauguration of Abraham Lincoln, which is one of the best inaugural addresses ever given. Arguably the best. I know it's probably my favorite, and we'll cover some lines of that in the reading activity, and we'll pull some lines for it from it uh, as we talk about Reconstruction. But some say that he even shook Lincoln's hand at the inauguration. Whether that's true, who knows. But it's kind of chilling to think that he was in that crowd. And uh, not long after that, in fact, about a month after that, he would go on to kill what most consider to be the greatest president in the history of our country. Uh, so that's going to do it. We finished talking about the battles. We covered Lincoln's assassination. If you were in class, and if you hear this in class, we'll go definitely a little more in depth. But for the purpose of the video lesson, I think the main points were covered. We have one more section in Unit 7, and that's going to be Reconstruction, or the rebuilding of the country, specifically the southern states, after the Civil War and the short-term and long-term impacts that has had on American society. 
Thank you so much. If you have any questions, please email me at bsbelt.clevelandcountyschools.org. Stay safe, wear a mask, social distance, wash your hands. Thank you so much for your hard work.